I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. In the early 1900s, our sailing boats traded across the globe. Dead ahead, 80 yards. And our fishing fleets fed the nation. It's a time that we often look back on with nostalgia. In it comes, in it comes, quickly. Herring, brilliant boys. But what was it like for everyday communities who made their living from the sea? Four modern-day families are heading back over a hundred years to the start of the 20th century. Oh, gosh, look. To live for a month as a small fishing community on the wild, exposed coast of Anglesey. We're about to embark on the adventure of a lifetime. In their second week, the men head out to sea. Well, there's someone on that. Go on, then. And get their first taste of success. I haven't felt that before. Yeah! I'm looking forward to going back and giving them the good news that we've, uh, we've got a hold of fish. But for the women... Adwell's pants. It's a constant battle with domestic life. I am going to make lunch, I am going to wash your clothes, and I am going to make some bread. But tension surfaces in the community. I think for most of the families on the island, the honeymoon has now finished. Okay. Half a cheese sandwich in 24 hours. Just can't feed ourselves. Simple as that. But if you've got a load of eggs, you're fine. Will they fall in love with the past, or will they fall apart on the 1900 island? Have we smashed it? The four families were living as a 1900 fishing community on the tidal island of Sandwin off the coast of Anglesey have made it through their first week. Plagued by storms, so far the men have failed to catch a single fish and only a last minute haul of shellfish by the women brought in some much needed cash. But it was far from enough and food rations are once again running low. We can always buy some more raisins and put raisins on top of fixing black. I know, but things are quite pricey. Until your dad brings in a decent catch of fish, I want to just wait, because I don't know how long that money is. We've got, what, 15p left? So I, um, I don't really want to be spending. Yeah. Mother of five, Natalie, and her husband, office worker, Gavin Davis, have struggled to feed their family since they arrived on the island. As a fisherman, not catching anything. First of all, losing a lot of pride over that, because I want to go out and have a successful day and provide for everybody and be on my own family. And um, secondly, just need that sense of achievement. For retirees, Cheryl... I've been out since about 6.15 to collect some mushrooms. And Clive Barker, Keeping a tight rein on their purse strings has been a challenge. I've had to do it because we're skin. I've overspent. I've been really bad with my budgeting <laughs> and overspent on everything. You're just living a high life, you know. I mean? <laughs> we're used to gourmet meals, that's what it is. So, you know, it's a habit we can't break. <laughs> if things are too austere and too hard, you get very downheartened and it's quite easy to do that, especially if you're not eating well. Life for the Barkers hasn't been helped by a flare-up of gout in Clive's left foot. It stopped him heading out to sea and earning an income. In 1900, I suppose, if you were ill, you'd just take to your bed and, and hope for the best. We wouldn't be around at our age, I doubt, in That's 1900. Thing, no, I think we're well past our sell-by date for 1900. 1900. <laughs> <laughs> 
As well as coping with the day-to-day -day details, the families are also grappling with the bigger questions about how the community should function. Mum of three, Lydia. The thing I miss the most is hot running water. Yeah. And sports development officer and leader in their church, Gareth Power, hope they can use their Christian values to help keep the community together. We've got to remain united no matter what, no matter what differences in personalities. You know, we've just got to get on and we've got to be there for one another and that that is vital to our success. But not everyone shares the same vision. It well, should be a good day for it today, though. Nice and calm, slight breeze. Blacksmith Arwell John and university lecturer Kate Evans have a different view of communal living, especially Arwell, who spent many years living off-grid back in the 21st century. I'm familiar with this way of living, and I suppose I went through that naivety when I first moved into a, an off-grid community. And the one thing that concerned me early on was the amount of sharing and community spirit going on. Because you still have to make sure you're healthy and well fed. If you can't look after yourself, then how are you expected to look after other people? It's mid-morning, and offshore, the fishing boat is waiting to take the men out to sea. <laughs> All the families have been finding it hard but Gavin and Natalie, with their five children, have the most at stake. Natalie, I think she's uh, struggling quite a bit. I'm a bit worried. I don't think she's eating terribly well at all. I think she's so worried that the children aren't getting enough that she's going without food. The need for fish is greater than ever. Food now is getting a little bit scarce. Well, more than scarce. Um, there's literally nothing in. Is this the big day? It's got to be done today. Really has got to we be done. We need fish. Today. We're at the bottom. So we're earning the same as the other houses, but if there's only two of you to feed, then you can be eating like kings. Men are wearing modern life jackets as the only 21st century concession, and they're back under the watchful eye of skipper Stuart Gibson. Morning, morning. Are you, are you ready to do paddle again once more? And professional fisherman Mickey Beachy. Last bit of exercise in the morning. He's been fishing since he was eight. The reality is they're actually living on what they catch or what they forage and uh, it's a struggle for them. Gareth was seasick on their first fishing trip. I'm hoping I'm going to fare a bit better this time. Otherwise, it could be a long eight hours. I think Gareth, God bless him, he's such a lovely chap and he's mild-mannered. But he just needs to up the ante a bit. Glad you got it, Gareth. Arwell, on the other hand, tends to want to do things his own way. I'm constantly checking the uh, direction of the breeze. He's a bit, bit uh, alone to himself at times. If the breeze is right, we can get the power in the sail and we can move forward. But he's very practical. Seriously, this is so far out of my comfort zone, it's stupid. But Gavin, at the moment, is my number one. So you're not going to pull, you're up on the foredeck. He doesn't back chat. So you're going to be doing other things. He wants to do well for the family and the community and really bust a gut. There's a great feeling amongst the fellas on this boat that it's time for us to step up and provide for him. Last week, they attempted simple hand lining. Today, Mickey's teaching them to use the more challenging long line. The glass boys are what they would have used back in the day. So I'm 
hoping that they last. Otherwise, we're going to lose a long line. The long line sits just above the seabed and will hopefully catch bottom feeders like skate and dogfish. Right, keep your hands out there. They won't know if the line has caught anything until they pick it up at the end of the day. Perfect. They'll be handlining for mackerel and herring until then. I'm always superstitious, so I never say, yeah, we're going to get a good haul until we get out there and actually do it. So, see how we go on. Back on dry land. The women are once again hard at work. It's been non-stop since they arrived on the island, and today is no exception. For the working classes of 1900, every Monday is laundry day. This is their white laundry soap. Can I help you, Grace? The women each have a manual to help them. We've got to grate the soap into here. Which includes instructions for making their own washing soap. And then add hot water. Washing powder, as we know it, wasn't invented until 1907. This one I made earlier, and it's become like um, oh, slime. Slime. It is like slime, isn't it? Every garment must be washed individually and in a strict order. I wouldn't want to do my washing every single week on one of these. Is hard going. Just look at the colour of that. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> And Will's pants. And some socks. Kate's getting to grips with a traditional washing dolly, along with a bucket and mangle. It was the 1900 equivalent of a modern washing machine. <sighs> what a gift for a laundry. Even just a simple little washing machine in that corner. That's my washing machine, a pot. I've cooked food in that this week. I'm washed dishes in it, and now I'm washing clothes in it. That's worked well, isn't it? Look how lovely and uh, white and shiny that is. <laughs> Check in that line and drop them down here. Keep moving that line, that. The men have been handlining for over two hours. I'll check this in now, see, see what we've got. But they've yet to get a bite. Come on, boys, pull them in. The pressure's mounting. Where's that one gone? Come on, Gat. Get on the line, boy. One of the big motivations for me coming out here was for my kids to see me doing something meaningful. After being made redundant in 2013, Gavin spent three years struggling to provide for his family. I want them to see me come off the boat with a catch so they can see that their dad's achieving something. Hello. I think there's something on here. No. Ah, oh, balls. Ow. Ooh, yeah, it's just really hot, the water. With seven sets of clothes to wash, Natalie's still up to her elbows in laundry. Look, it's not even dirty, and things just get put. Do you know how hard it is to wash when it's like this? Not this week. Not this week, they're not shoving it in the wash. You're wearing it till it crawls off you. To add to Natalie's frustration, her two daughters, 15-year-old Ruby and 13-year-old Lily, still aren't pulling their weight. They seem to have a lot watching me and nobody helping me. Something that Natalie's all too familiar with in their modern life. I'd happily do it on the washing machine, just you have to show me how to do it. But you won't, because you've got so many other things to do, so I don't want to bother you when you're doing stuff. It is written <laughs> on oh, the God. machine <laughs> what to do. It doesn't. 
a spoiled generation that complain about turning on a washing machine. I am going to give you a drink. I am going to make lunch. I am going to give you a drink. I am going to wash your clothes and I am going to make some bread. Oh, how disheartening is that? It's got all rust on it from the mangle. Oh, good God, look at that. It is actually a lot more work than the men, really. I mean, it's a bit of a doddle out fishing, isn't it? Think about it. <laughs> Clive, who worked as a fisherman in the 1970s, is also having a challenging day. He's bedridden with gout. Clive is desperate to get out in the boats, which is his main passion. I'm sure it'll happen if he can just be patient. It's meant he's missed yet another fishing trip. The toe's still very swollen and it's tender. It's been a long time now, so... It'd be a big relief when it does go. Living in 1900 is proving a massive challenge for all the families. And out at sea, the men are still empty-handed. I've been fishing for a long time and, you know, we go out there some days and you spend hours and hours on end fishing and you don't catch anything. It's a world away from the bountiful catches at the start of the 20th century, when in just one day in 1907, 90 million herring were landed near Great Yarmouth. Fish aren't so plentiful these days as they were back then. I think the biggest challenges are factory trawlers or whatever that actually, you know, suck up tons of fish at a time. That's the difference between then and now, and it's a massive contributor to lack of fish being in the ocean. Us as a species, you know, have ruined the seas. It's a sobering reality for all modern fishermen, and one that isn't helping the novices who are relying on century-old fishing techniques. Oh, there's someone on that. Go on, then. I haven't felt that before. Hey, hey, hey! That's a mackerel, but I think he's a bit small. We'll measure him. He is actually in size. I think we've got another few yet. Yeah. Hey! So the boys, they're here. I could smell them this morning from the beach. Finally, they've hit a shoal of mackerel. Loads of fish here. And can land any over 20 centimetres. Hold on, yeah. Wow. A modern day regulation. What you do when you dispatch the mackerel is this finger in the mouth, yeah, thumb at the back, and stop shaking. Oh, that's oh, what I get. Two, a three. Three. Oh, just to the top, just to the top. Oh. It's not pleasant to do. It's got to be done under the circumstances. I've got something here, I reckon. Good lad. That's a, that's a winner. That's a thrill, that. That's amazing. I told you, didn't I, Gav? That beats anything I've achieved in the last 20 years in an office. I'll tell you that much. Yes, got us going. That's the best good oh, out there. Along with the haul of mackerel, the long line has also caught some dogfish. We're going to need a bigger boat. Not only is it a great catch, but for Gareth, who spent most of last week's fishing trip being sick, he's finally found his sea legs. I'm looking forward to going back and, and uh, giving him the good news that we've, uh, we've got a haul of fish. It's been a superb day today. I'm chuffed to bits. Go back, head held high, and we smashed it. Daddy! Is he back? Yes! Can you see the boat? Yes! OK, we'll come in. Is it good news? They look happier, they look more energetic. Yeah. Oh, please, 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 please. Daddy. Please. Daddy. Since they arrived on the island, storms and inexperience have hampered their progress. But at last, 
they've got something they can be proud of. There's about 40 mackerel in there. They've caught 44 mackerel and three dogfish. Well done, Meg. Look at you. I really are proud of us. Really, really am. Can I touch it? Can I touch it? So is it mackerel and dogfish? I've never seen dogfish before. No, me neither. I don't think the dogfish will fetch much money. Clive can deal with them very easily. If, I know you don't like the look of them now. By the time Clive's finished with them, <laughs> nice you'll have a nice little piece, of, piece of white fish, no bone, just cartilage, mm. so the children can eat them. And I think we could all do with it, actually. We could all do with some protein. I think so. I think the kids need the protein. Both in 1900 and today, dogfish aren't regarded as a high-value species, but the families are banking on the mackerel fetching a good price from the fishmonger. Up to everybody else. Lydia's negotiating. I trust Lydia's Lydia. a negotiator, absolutely. Whatever decision you take, Lydia, I might go and do it. Mike Hurd, a fourth generation fishmonger from nearby Carnarvon, has arrived to see what's on offer. Tell us the prices that you'd normally Well, uh, we'd have to the sort them out in small and large. That's small, that. It's the small and mackerel. Small. Yeah. yeah. Would you, do you buy the small ones? Buy the small ones, but not the same price as the big ones, obviously. No. Okay. And what, what kind of price are we looking at? Three P for the small ones. Okay. Three pence each for the small mackerel. Okay. And maybe. Six, six, six for, for the them. medium. Six. Six for the medium and the large, then. I can't see any large, can you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Who's going to get the hands dirty? Save so counting them and messing about. So we say four and a half. If yeah. everybody's happy with that, no. then. Yeah. That sounds good to me. Good, okay, good. You've got yourself a deal. Diane. Oh, I'm thrilled with that. Yeah, I'm thrilled with that. It's definitely lifted the spirits now of, of, the, of the whole community. It's lifted the spirits of them all. I feel elated. Everybody's smiling, everyone feels good. It's just the best feeling. So, one shilling. As was traditional, the money's being divided between everyone on the boat, including Mickey and Stuart, who gets an extra share for providing the fishing vessel. So basically, Stuart, you get 55 double, so 110, and 55 for the other four men. 55 pennies was the average daily wage for a fisherman in 1900. It's up to them what to do with it then and whether to share with uh, Clive and Shero. OK, fantastic. Mackerel's gone, and here's our tea. OK. Clive, who missed out on the fishing today because of his gout, isn't entitled to a share of the earnings. Most people catch them, bring them around and give them to me because they don't want to do them, so... But as a former professional fisherman, he still has much to offer. Get the fins off first. Don't need a tail. I have no idea how to do this whatsoever, but... Um... I mean, that's the benefit of having Clive here. Out of it. If he wasn't here, we'd probably still be going hungry. There's a bit of meat there, if you want to bother with it, we could do. That's called the belly flap, that bit there. If you take that out, if you can get the skin off of that, you've got a bit more meat, which is quite nice. See, this is exactly the kind of knowledge we need. And this is the reason why we want to give you a share of the take today. Oh, that's very kind of you. I know you... Well, we all know that you're incapacitated at the moment, but... <laughs> All you need to know, Clive, is that we wouldn't have got through this without you and Cheryl, most definitely. So, for me and my family, I'd like to give you a share. Right, very, um, very kind of you. Of our much, take. To much put appreciated. Your yeah, we'll, uh... I'm going to leave you that buzz and I'm going to shake your hand. Oh, thank you very much. All right. And you got dogfish tonight? Dogfish tonight. See you again. Have you prepared that? Dogfish well? tonight for you. Cheers, Clive. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, was our share for you. Most kind of you. Very kind of you. Oh, God, we're, we're on a roll here. Yeah. Jock and Clive. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, Gavin us. Thank G Gavin us. Given, given us, sorry. A share. Given us a, That's a share. That's very nice, very nice. Isn't it? Yeah. As the sun sets, the families all tuck into their first fish supper since arriving on the island. What do you think of the fish? Hmm. I'm pleasantly surprised. More meaty than cod. Ah, it is a bit more meaty than cod. 
Seeing them walk up there with a the basket full of fish, yeah. They all did really well today. I'm getting a sense that the 1900 man, it was feast or famine with those guys. If they went out and had a good catch, they got this feeling today. But we've experienced the down times as well where we didn't catch anything. And I'm sure there's testing times ahead. As a new day dawns, the sun's out. But the wind is blowing and the swell is increasing. Fishing is off the cards once again. Fortunately, all the families have a secondary income. I don't think they talk to me. Arwell's checking his chickens to ensure they're healthy and happy. They're making all the right noises and behaving as, as I'd expect. Getting on average 11, 11 eggs a day at the moment. At three pennies for four eggs, it's a good earner. Do you have any eggs for sale? Four would be lovely. Four? Yeah. And as one of the few sources of protein on the island, when there's no fish, they're doing a healthy trade. There's only two mouths to feed, so we haven't got to feed the whole family. But we are doing quite well on money. For Lydia, Earning a small profit from the shop in her front room is a welcome boost. And today, she's received a grocery delivery. Oh, brilliant. What's in here? Oh, packages. Oh, that says Cadbury's there, Cadbury's. Oh, that's Cadbury's. In addition to the basics, there are a few luxury items. Cadbury's cocoa essence. Pure cocoa. Wow. Oh. The early 1900s saw a boom in consumerism. Manufacturers began to expand their product ranges, and improved transport links brought remote communities within reach. So I hope people are ready to spend their pennies. Oh, that's nice. I don't know what that is. Luxury items didn't come cheap. A tin of cocoa was the equivalent of just over half of a fisherman's daily wage. Oh, that smells, that smells pretty good. What do we make with cocoa powder? Chocolate. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Great. <laughs> That's probably like gold dust. Yeah. Right, Marsani. Marsani. Uh, Griff was having a little play with the, the tin and pulled the lid off and spilled it. This is going top shelf straight away. The new products are worth nothing unless Lydia can sell them. I have in some cold cream. Oh, that smells so nice. For the working classes in 1900. <laughs> it just smells so clean. Smelling nice was a luxury few could afford. Yeah, that's one shilling, two pennies. No. Sorry, that is okay. well out of my price range. It's hard, because you have to just sort of look and then walk away and think, no, I don't need any of that. I need meat and sort of like the staples, butter, sugar, lard. Maybe if we have two days of really good catch, then it's a maybe. Um, but at the moment, no. For the Davis family, Natalie's earning extra cash baking bread. Getting quicker, getting better. But with the most mouths to feed and at a meagre penny a loaf, it's not going very far. The 1899 Education Act of England and Wales stated that all children between the ages of five and 12 had to go to school. David, 
I'm not very happy with that shirt. Take it in, please. But truancy was still very common, as children were often needed to work and contribute to the family income. So, children, I want you to have a look at my blackboard here and tell me what is on it. A map. A map of what? The world. The world. So, for your title, could you please write on the top of your boards, the world. In 1905, almost three quarters of primary school teachers in England and Wales were women. Modern day teacher Carrie Morgan Barley comes to teach the children every weekday from 9 till 3.30. What do we get from the West Indies? Sugar. Sugar and nutmeg, excellent. And what do we get from China? <gasps> David. Tea. Tea. Well done. Sugar. It was only a select minority of women that could get work as a teacher. The majority went into domestic service. S-U-G-A-R. As working class teenagers, Ruby and Lily's education is over. I was thinking to maybe help get a little bit of money in. Mm. Yeah. Maybe you could do the neighbours washing after you saw me doing it. I didn't you do it. Mm. Oh, I can't watch you really paying attention. While boys over 12 often worked in dangerous manual jobs like fishing, Ruby and Lily would have been sent to work for wealthier households. You're off that age, you can't just be sat outside watching the children play. You need to be actively working then. Yeah. Okay. Right. See you later. Right, see you in a bit. Bye. Love you. Love you. I think she does need to understand that that is what, you know, what girls her age were doing. Doesn't matter what you like, you're going to do, you know, chores. That's it. I like you when she did some washing. <laughs> I didn't have to do it. <laughs> For you. Do you have any jobs for us to do? What's your ironing like? Oh. <laughs> As the wealthiest household at the moment, the Johns are happy to help the girls out. There you go, then, girls. Mm. Yeah. Go crazy. That's my head scarf. Go on, got it. A century ago, domestic service was Britain's number one employer. It's quite heavy. It was normal for young working class girls to do a large household's laundry, ironing and cleaning, as well as helping in the kitchens. I find it in under quite sexist because I can't do the things that the men have to get to do. So it's quite unfair to be honest. It's annoying. It's taken forever just to do this one shirt. And I'm not even, like, half done yet. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> That's the only word you can use to describe it. Ugh. I'd really want to play outside right now. <laughs> I wonder what they're playing. We got threepence. Well done. No. Well done. Well done, girls. Well done, all of you. For two hours' work, Kate's paid the girls three pennies, about 50p each in today's money. Was that from the ironing you did, Ru? Yeah. Yeah. It's a far cry from back home. We're lucky if we can get Ruby out of a bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do anything at home, but here I'm doing a lot. I'm shattered. Probably as the man of the house, I'd be actually pushing Ruby out the door. So there's one less mouth to feed, telling her to go work, telling her to find a man. And that's quite a sobering thought when you, when you think about it. All you were good for was cleaning and looking after the kids. That was your role in society. I think it's completely stupid. I think yeah. it's just make everything equal for everyone and everyone will be happy. And that's why I'm proud of you, because that's the attitude you would have needed 
to fight for your position in the world back then. In the early 1900s, British society was far from equal. Women's rights were limited, and it wasn't until 1918 that women won the right to vote. Dav, do you score one? Oh, he's away! Remember, not too close. Ah. Oh, I don't <laughs> Good boy, Ev. Go on, Ev. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, I'm on his board. It's another day on Sandwin, and the wind and swell are still putting fishing on hold. The Davises are once again tightening their belts. And that's my tea for seven. Seven people. Because we've been what, averaging about ten eggs a day. Um, yeah, it's been about ten a day. We've about nine or ten eggs a day. With less money coming into the community, Kate and Arwell's egg business is starting to suffer. We could, if we're not careful, end up with a glut of eggs. They're trying to work out a new marketing plan. In the shop, the eggs would retail for a penny each. So the plan is, if we sold them all to Lydia, buy all of the eggs as we get them at halfpenny each. And then you can sell them for a penny each and you get the profit. And we won't try and sell them on the side or anything like that. This offer would pass all the risk to Lydia and her shop. But Arwell's in two minds. It's a big markup, though. It is a big markup. It could be their big owner. It could be our, our big owner and their big owner. But I'd rather, it, I'd rather it was our big owner. Well, there we are. So that's the, that's the alternative option, is that we keep them ourselves and we just sell them. Yeah. Kate and Arwell are brilliant. And at the end of the day, they're running a business um, and, you know, they need income themselves. Everyone is just surprised at the price of eggs. And that is the same price as a loaf of bread, where Natalie has to put hours of work in to make the bread. Whereas an egg, you just walk outside, pick it up. Pretty much pure profit. Food in 1900 was relatively more expensive with no 21st century intensive farming techniques. Bread cost up to three times as much as today while eggs cost 10 times more. As long as there's a real spirit of generosity amongst us, then I think the community can continue to succeed. Because you cannot have children going hungry. Aware that there's a growing inequality between the families, Lydia's using her position as shopkeeper to ensure that the orders are fairly distributed. Kate has got both beef and bacon. And rather than tell you your bacon hasn't arrived, I can tell Kate her bacon hasn't arrived. Because I'm sure because she's alright, because she's already got beef anyway. Okay. So they're living, they've got loads of meat next door, never they've... like kings. Oh I know. Don't worry about it. No, we've got bloody twelve eggs a day round next door as well. I know. What are we giving our kids? Absolutely nothing. I know. But we're a big family. It's not the point now, he's charging a fortune for bloody What did we have for lunch today? I had an apple core. You had an apple core for lunch? An apple core and you were worried about them not having enough meat next door? I know, I know. It's just the way it is. I just think, think it's overpriced and being held to ransom, that's all. I know. But it's, a, it's their prerogative, it's their business. I have to respect that. That's what they want to charge, that's what they want to charge. I just need to find a way of getting protein into five children's bellies. Um. And eggs are a perfect way of getting that. But at those prices, we just have to find a different way of doing it. Yeah. As the family's second week on the island nears its end, there's only one household having eggs for breakfast. 
Who's that? So, where's Daddy's bacon? It's oh, gone. It's gone. <laughs> Completely gone. Doesn't bacon. Do you know what I'm having? Flatbreads with butter. Mom, oh, there's no Daddy. flatbreads either. There's no flatbreads. Do you know what I'm having? Daddy's. Butter. <laughs> Not everything's going Kate and Arwell's way either. One of their chickens has developed a life-threatening infection in its foot. It's not good news, really. And the best thing for a chicken is to, uh, to end her days, unfortunately. Uh, it's for their own happiness, really. I'd rather she go out a happy chicken rather than live the rest of her days out in miseries. But uh, on the flip side, uh, it's nearly Sunday, so I think someone might have a nice roast dinner on Sunday. So I'm going to go finish her off peacefully and as quickly as I and cleanly as I can. Arwell grew up on a farm in West Wales, so is familiar with the most humane way to dispatch the chicken. Oh, no but, uh, no, you can see there what the problem is. It's never a pleasant task, and I'm I'm quite happy that that went very well first time. The chicken will be hung overnight before being gutted and plucked, ready for the table tomorrow. And with a sea much calmer, the chance to go fishing is once again on the cards. You can pull, pull that out of there, just to clean it up a bit. But as the rest of the community prepare for the next trip... I'm flying a flag oh. of any nation. A large sailing boat spotted heading their way. A tree to know where she's come from. In the 1900s, thousands of boats transported goods around our coast and across the world. By 1905, Wales was exporting 45 million tonnes of coal a year. It wasn't uncommon for cargo boats to sail into small fishing harbours at high tide and beach themselves as the tide went out so that local men could be paid to unload them. I've had a word with the skipper and he's looking for some, uh, some boys to, to unload the cargo. Are you interested in some labour? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. OK. Yeah. Paid labour? No, if it's paid labour, count me in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well? In. It's coal and flour. It's the perfect opportunity for both men and women to earn some extra income. Okay, lower weight. And unlike fishing, it's guaranteed. The men are unloading the boat, while the women are scrubbing the boat's hull. Okay. Okay, lower weight. The sand's my biggest worry. Well, it's not a worry, it's just a bit of a pain. It just slows you down that much more. And moving your own weight through the sand is hard enough, let alone carrying two big sacks of coal. So I think I've probably got about 60 pounds on my shoulder. It's quite physical. I'm not quite sure I'm uh, built for such laborious tasks. For fishermen and women in the 1900s, Hard physical graft was all in a day's work. But for our modern day families, it's proving a shock. He's got his angry face on, and I don't know why. I don't know whether it's because it's just so heavy. He just looks, he looks really cross. When I don't get a smile, 
and there is really cross. Of all the men in the village, with a household of seven, Gavin's calorie intake has taken the biggest hit. How many of these are there? Oh, a couple of hundred. Now we're... Half a cheese sandwich in 24 hours. And, and two forks full of uh, corned beef. Giving everything to the kids because the bloody eggs are too expensive. But surviving on so little food, absolutely killing me. Just, I just can't feed ourselves. Simple as that. <laughs> just had enough. Get past this. Be fine. Because sometimes in this environment, it's, it's harder than it looks to live in. Just the basic necessity of food alone. Not having that. And feeding your kids first leaves you with very little to operate on. But if you've got a load of eggs, you're fine. I mean, having the chickens has been a bit of a blessing in disguise, really. And some of some that we've heard the odd whisper, like, oh, but it's just pure profit. <laughs> yeah, all you're doing is collecting the eggs and selling them. But no, I mean, I'm cleaning the chickens out, I'm checking their health. They do take work in themselves. I'm not just waiting there for the morning, like, go on, where's the egg? Both, there's another, there's another penny, lovely. But Arwell's eggs aren't the only bone of contention. The chickens are... Uh... I know it's been killed, oh, right. but we don't know where it is now. Well, I asked Arwell what he was going to do with it. I asked him if he was going to eat it. And he said, no, it's worth too much money to eat. So I said, I don't think there's enough money in the village to buy it. So he said he'd probably eat it. Right, is he sharing? No. That's a question for him. No. That's a question for him. Well, OK, <laughs> hope it chokes him. <laughs> <laughs> but all of the families have their own income as not just the fish. I mean, uh, yes. the Davises, they bake. You have the shop with the powers. That's an income for them. And the Barkers, they've got the tavern. That's an income for them. So, I mean, we all have our own little ways of bringing in the sideline. I think I've just got to put a lid on it. I think everything's just magnified in this environment. Yeah. You know, you're tired, hungry. Sometimes you are running on empty, and it's very hard. It must have been tough on them. The reality is nothing here comes easy. No. There's effort, be it financial outlay or time. Nothing here is easy. I think for most of the families on, on the island, the honeymoon has now finished. Thanks for your help. Got some money here for you. First of all, ladies. Despite their differences, for everyone, it's payday. Thank you. But in 1900, women were nearly always paid less than men. So the men are getting two shillings sixpence each, and the women are only receiving one shilling. At the start of the 20th century, for the working classes, Saturday night was bath night. I'm not sure we're just making it dirtier. You are. Most families could only afford to wash once a week, sharing the same water. Just pour it all over. Not fast, just bit by bit. Oh, my goodness, look at the dirt. Is that off my hands or your face? My face. <laughs> it was customary for the man of the house to go first. And the youngest child, last. Let's get you into your bed. Thank you. 
With cash in their pockets, the families and the crew of the cargo boat celebrate a hard day's work. The tavern, which historically would have been men only, has relaxed its rules, and tonight, everyone's welcome. Hello, guys. Um, hey, hi. Hi, uh, my name is Yannick. What's your name? Uh, Gareth. Gareth, yeah. nice to meet you. Have you haven't said hello properly yet? Gareth. We haven't, yeah. You're all right, mate. Nice You're to okay. meet you. Good to see you again. I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, um, I'm, I've got no place to stay tonight. Does anyone have any, like, uh, spare bed or something? I'm willing to pay, by the way, so... Well, actually, I think we could accommodate there. We had a spare room. Oh, oh, yeah. One of the cargo boat crew, 21-year-old Yannick Martinez, has decided to jump ship, a relatively common occurrence. You got a bed? We have a bed. In the 1900s, over 28% of merchant seamen were foreign-born. She's an excellent cook as well. Oh, wow, well, that, that adds to it. <laughs> Good porridge in the morning. Yeah. Lunch. <laughs> what, yeah. what sort of money were you thinking of? Two shillings and sixpence a week. I think I can do that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Then we have a deal. We have a deal. And if you're yeah. eating too much, it'll have to go up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the village, Yannick. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the village. Hey. Thank you, thank Welcome, you. Welcome, Yannick. Cargo boat's been a great boost to the community. It's brought in cash and a lodger for the barkers. You are a bit short of cash, so yes, it'll be a big help. Hopefully, oh. it will improve our finances. I'm not sure how we'll cope with the intrusion on the privacy. I won't be able to walk around naked to use the chamber pot in the middle of the night, will I? Or nor will you. <laughs> <laughs> It's Sunday, the Sabbath, and in 1900, it's a day of worship and rest. Our house guest, Yannick, is a very nice young man. He's a little bit off the wall and he reminds us a little bit of our son. Yannick's modern life as a computer science student at Bangor University is about as far removed from 1900 life as you can get. Yesterday I went to sleep and I was pretty excited about waking up as well. <laughs> because I, I, I didn't know what to expect this day and I still don't know. Yannick was born in Spain and has lived in several different countries, but is currently settled in the UK. I'm at a stage in my life where I'm sort of trying to figure out, OK, what do I want to do? And I realise I want to do pretty much everything, really. I want to go to the edge of the world, as far as I can go. As a hub of global sea travel, by the start of the 20th century, the UK was seeing a steady influx of overseas sailors. There is a knife, OK. Thank you. Yeah. The 1905 oh, Aliens on. Act introduced new controls. For the first time, immigrants had to register on arrival at British shores. It's like potato. Beef and onion. And potato. Potato. Yeah. And potato. Mm. Yannick will need to find a job if he wants to stay. Mm. Right, yeah. That's really good, yeah. Good. <laughs> They're all pretty welcoming so far. Mm. I wonder mm. who this is. Mama. What are you looking for? <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> something to eat. I want something to eat, oh, darling. In 1900, working class children often begged for food. And within less than two weeks, the Davis's youngest child has picked up the habit. Are you still hungry, Arlo? Your belly. Your belly's mm. hungry, is it? <laughs> when I came in yesterday, uh, I heard some stories. I heard someone say that they had to go without eating just so that they could feed the little ones. And there's lack of food and things for the kids. Everyone becomes grumpy and they're hungry. My fear would be that people turn on each other. If we all sort of work as a team and understand this, then it, will, it should, be, should be okay. 
With a community spirit still fragile, Lydia's trying to bring everyone back together. Hi, Carrie, it's okay? Hello, Aiden. Just to let you know, we're gonna hold a service in our house. Okay, no problem. So, would you like to come along? It's gonna be little, just a little thing yeah. in our house. No yeah? problem. Okay. Hab, we're aiming for about half past ten. Grand. All right. See okay, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Ta -da. Fishing communities were often deeply religious, and it provided much needed spiritual support. With only a ruined chapel on the island, the families are coming together in the power's front room. We all scrub up pretty well. Good looking audience. I'm going to read a little passage now from, from the Bible. It contains fish and fishing, so I thought we'd probably relate to this in a different way. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. We're all trying to um, survive the challenge and overcome it. Children and I think this is where we've all got to pull together. They answered him, no. And he said unto Support them, one another, be generous with one another, be there for one another. They cast their four. And if we can make our priority being united and helping meet the needs of those around us, then I think everyone's a winner in those situations. All right, come on then. It was a lovely service. Gareth was just fabulous, he really was. Um, he did, he did a... He did a really good job. Arwell's chicken is gutted and ready for roasting. But instead of taking it home for himself... Can I have a quick word with my more dad outside? Yeah, yeah, come in. Oh, hello. <laughs> As you do. Hold on, Evan. Oh. It's all right. I've got this, I wondered if you were still interested. Not a lot of meat on her. Nice on Sunday. That's really, really generous of you. No problem. Seems we've just had a load of bacon. With cash in their pockets from yesterday's work, the Davis family have eaten well today, and Gavin's decided not to accept the chicken. All right, thanks. Well, it's very kind of you to think of us. But Arwell's offer seems to have made all the difference. How bad do I feel? He's just offered me the chicken. Don't worry, I said it's very, very kind. But you have the chicken. <laughs> he has restored my faith in humanity. Next time. The truth is, you're not eating enough. I am, fine. You're not, I know you're not. The Powers come up with a plan to help the Davises. We were thinking of putting together a food hamper. But not everyone's on side. I don't, I don't give charity like that. I don't like that. Personally, I cannot stand back and let friends starve. And the men head out on their toughest fishing trip yet. Let's fish, let's fish. 